right. Mm-hmm. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started this morning or afternoon, depending on where you're calling from. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aliyah Shahid, and I just want to thank you all for your time um, today and joining us uh, for our webinar. Um, so as more people start to trickle in, we'll just kind of go over some general housekeeping and the agenda. Um, if at any point during today's conversation, you know, questions come up, feel free to use the question and answer box. Um, that's a really great resource. And we'll definitely try and get to your questions during today's conversation. But we will also um, follow up, you know, if it's not a question that we have time to answer or address. Awesome. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. with our agenda. Um, so we're gonna start off with a welcome as we did. Um, and then we are going to hear from Chancellor in a moment to discuss Rise Economy's vision for a state CRA. Um, the goal of today's conversation is to focus on a statewide community reinvestment legislation and figure out how to bring more accountability and increase investments into BIPOC communities. Um, and so when we get to hear about Rise Economy's vision, you'll really get to understand why this is such an important um, piece of legislation that we're advocating for. Um, <clears throat> then we will go over about 35 minutes of moderated conversation. This is when we will be able to hear from our lovely panelists who will introduce themselves as they get a chance to speak. Um, during this webinar, as I mentioned, you will not be able to mute your unmute yourself um, unless you're a panelist, of course. And so, like I said, please use the question answer function, um, or you can also, you should be able to put your comments in the chat um, and we'll try and get to all of your questions and comments. We'll also have um, 10 minutes for question and answer after the panelists have a chance to speak. And then we will wrap up with our next steps um, as far as, you know, what, what we have, um, what we are thinking for, for the future as far as moving forward with this piece of legislation. So now we're going to get started. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, our Alliance member and board chair, Chancellor Amansur, to please unmute yourself and speak to our vision and a contribution to the ecosystem of state CRA advocates. Good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for joining uh, Rise Economy's webinar on uh, lending discrimination. And I thank you for allowing me to speak for a couple of minutes. I am the board chair, uh, the new board chair of Rise Economy. And I, uh, although I'm not new to, to Rise Economy, formerly known as CRC, I've been on the board for a number of years and um, it's great to see or to know a lot of you are, are joining us today to really talk, uh, to learn a little bit more about uh, how to prevent lending discrimination. So um, a, a little bit about the CRA and about how it is so impactful in protecting our civil rights. The, uh, the CRA, the, the Community Re Reinvestment Act's goal began in 1977 or before that, but it was enacted into law in 1977. And it was to address redlining and racism in the financial services industry. And while we have leveraged the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, to negotiate billions of dollars of investments in the state of California, there are still some gaps in the law and its implementation in terms of who is covered and who's not covered by it and how it's, co and how it's implemented. The financial services landscape is not the same as it was in 1977 or even 10, 20 years ago. And we've also seen that states, uh, in states like in New York, Illinois, Massachusetts, they've been able to pass statewide legislation to meet the needs of its LMI and its BIPOC communities and to increase the integrity and accountability in financial services and to ensure that, or at least try to ensure that their financial institutions try to meet the, the financial needs of their community members. We need a modern CRA that meets the needs of California communities today. And so here are a few points to consider as we enter into this discussion. First, um, a report by Cal Bradford in partnership with the Woodstock Institute that's titled, Violating Your Way to an 
outstanding CRA rating. In, in this, uh, in this uh, document, it was found uh, that in handing out CRA ratings, the financial regulatory agencies generally fail to consider fair lending and, uh, and uh, consumer law violations by banks, including redlining cases. The, the redlining cases are the very thing that the CRA was enacted, was created uh, to fight against. This report cited as one case study, our HUD uh, redlining complaint against One West CIT Bank, uh, which we settled. And uh, One West CIT Bank, like nearly all banks, never failed a CRA exam. Uh, federal CRA implementation does not sufficiently account for harm caused by banks, and the CRA ratings or grades given are often inflated. Second, in 2021, according to analysis from our own research um, analyst, Jamie Buell, independent mortgage companies originated 72.7% of all mortgages in the state. With such a high concentration of the lending market, these institutions must also be scrutinized to ensure that unfair lending practices and unlawful steering of borrowers into high cost products are not occurring. Finally, findings from DF DFPIs, and I'm sorry, I don't quite know the, all, the complete acronym for that, maybe somebody later will get into this, but, but the findings from uh, their first annual report of income from fees on non-sufficient funds and overdraft charges revealed that state uh, chartered credit uh, unions were among the worst actors when evaluating uh, uh, NSF non-sufficient fund and OD charges, um, overdraw, overdraw charges by both total revenue in dollars and as a proportion of total income. So with this, it will be no surprise to all of you that the state CRA, CRA that we envision would bring greater accountability to state chartered banks, credit unions, non-bank mortgage companies, and certain financial technology institutions as well. And, and it will help promote greater financial stabilities for all of California's communities. So we hope that all of you enjoy learning today a little bit more and be inspired from some of the speakers you're gonna hear from uh, about their state efforts. Uh, so thank you to so all of us. Uh, thank you for joining and uh, I'll turn it back to Aaliyah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor, um, for sharing that and for really just getting us set up for, you know, the reason that we are here today in conversation with each other. Um, so now I'm so excited to share with y'all our panelists who are leaders in their state. Um, as they come off of mute, they will have the chance to introduce themselves. Um, as Chancellor said, we hope that this conversation inspires California to really step into the 21st century and update its regulation for the financial services industry. In this conversation, we will learn from states who have successfully ran and implemented a state CRA bill with the intention of aspiring and strategizing for our own state CRA bill here in California. Today, we have representatives from Massachusetts, Illinois, and New York to share what they learned from their experiences. So on today's call, we are joined with we are joined by Barika Williams, the executive director of ANHD based in New York. We're joined by Jared Berrios, representing the California Community Foundation. We are also joined by Brent Adams um, from the Woodstock Institute based in Illinois. And lastly, we are joined by Thomas Callahan with the Partnership for Financial Equity. So now we are going to get into our panelists. And I do want to start with Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so the first person that I'm gonna call off the mic is Jarrett. And so <clears throat> Jarrett authored the bill um, in Massachusetts for seven years before it passed. So from the year 2000 to 2007. Is that correct, Jarrett? Yes, it's a long time ago, yes. Yes, 
it was a long time ago, you know, and I think that's important to kind of demonstrate that this is not a new struggle that we are trying to address. Um, but what was the specific problem that you were trying to solve there in Massachusetts? Sure. Thank you, Aliyah. Um, and I just want to acknowledge, uh, while I'm currently uh, uh, the head of grant making over at the California Community Foundation, which is the Community Foundation for Los Angeles, um, uh, at the time I was a legislator uh, in Massachusetts. I got to work with good people like Tom Callahan, who I think you're going to hear from in a little bit. Um, and I think you'd asked us to sort of introduce ourselves a little bit when we go. So I'm just going to say quickly of relevance to this. Um, when I was in law school, I worked at the Federal Trade Commission uh, doing a uh, post law school uh, doing consumer consumer credit practices like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. We looked at Humda data um, and then uh, I had the opportunity to do some Title VIII uh, fair housing work uh, as well. Uh, and so that was uh, when I ran for office, I was going door to door uh, and met a gentleman in my district named Jim Campen, who uh, happened to be the leading expert, uh, uh, at least in Massachusetts, on tracking home and doing analysis with Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. And a conversation ensued uh, that led us both to sort of fret over the evolution in the home mortgage market from depository to non-depository institutions. That is that increasingly we were seeing, this was now in 1999, 1998, 1999, that uh, more and more mortgages weren't really subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. Massachusetts had a state Community Reinvestment Act that applied to state chartered banks and credit unions. Um, and obviously there's the Federal Community Reinvestment Act, but mortgage companies, which were, I think at that point, over 70%, kind of like California, were completely unregulated. Regulated. There was really no way to understand uh, uh, sort of what they were doing and to really obligate them. But there were some hooks that we had, right? They mortgage brokers in mortgage companies in Massachusetts have to get licensed as mortgage brokers. That licensing process allowed us to develop legislation which we could require as part of your licensing a satisfactory Community uh, Reinvestment Act uh, report. Not that they were evaluated every year, but you know, sort of as part of a re, uh, sort of a your application or your reapplication process, and that became the 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 kernel of this idea. So they they're obviously different than banks. The licensing process for a mortgage company was not the same as a bank, but the same the same idea that you have to get licensed became the hook. Uh, and so we uh, spent seven years. Uh, we at first had opposition from many of our bank uh, our banks in Massachusetts, but eventually uh, the Massachusetts Bankers Association came on board. They saw this as leveling the playing field. Even I think in California, where you don't have a Community Reinvestment Act, banks uh, would benefit from this by having their competitors in this market uh, really have to do some of the same stuff many banks already have to do. Uh, we thought that uh, uh, it would be something that the additional scrutiny uh, uh, would also allow us to kind of encourage and recognize some of the good mortgage brokers, or by good, I mean the ones that were already doing business, but provide even additional, attract additional competition for the consumer's dollars in lower income census tracts. And um, it seems to be working. Uh, and maybe I would, I'll pause here because I think Tom has a lot more to say uh, on that. So I'll hand it back to you, Olia. Thank you so much uh, for that. And um, I did have like kind of a follow-up question just because I I know you're familiar that, you know, we advocated for a state CRA last year. And, you know, we learned a lot from that experience and we'll definitely be back again with another bill next year. And so I imagine, you know, in, in that seven year journey and you kind of spoke to it, some of the pushback, some of the naysayers and, you know, just sure. the difficulties that you had with, you know, the opposition. Um, and so as we think about, you know, the pushing back, you know, against them, can you tell us, you know, what some of those opposing arguments were, um, who were some yeah. of your biggest opponents, and what was the prevailing rationale at the end? Like how, and you kind of spoke to this a little bit, but how did you win them over or sort of neutralize them? Well, the a couple of important things to note, and, and you'll have to do your own analysis in California, but one of the myths I firmly believe was that, you know, mortgage brokers are mom and pop shops uh, and 
uh, this is, they're, they're, they're not anywhere, anything like a bank. In fact, in Massachusetts, I think only nine out of the 51 licensed mortgage companies were from Massachusetts, or currently. So we've sort of, in the analysis since the law has passed, so the large majority are large out-of-state mortgage, com uh, mortgage companies seeking these brokerage licenses these mortgage broker licenses. These are companies in this, and, and like banks, they ha both have the sophistication and we have the need for them. Uh, they have the sophistication to comply and we would have the need. We want to make sure uh, that they're uh, really marketing their products in all parts of the state. And I think the argument, I think you should expect that argument here. A related argument is that, you know, mortgage companies are, are not like banks. You know, they don't have a geography like a bank has a geography. That's really a distinction without a difference. That might be the case. You might operate statewide or in large sections of state. Um, and CRA tends to look at specific geographies for banks. But you can look at the entire state and do comparative census tract analysis, right, for in lower income and uh, um, higher income census tracts in the same way that you would do that within a particular geography. So it doesn't really matter that a mortgage company uh, is statewide uh, or uh, doesn't adhere to a particular geography, that that's not the nature of their business. You'll probably hear that. And I think you should just, I think the experience, at least in Massachusetts, has been that has uh, actually no impact on their lending analysis and some of their other analyses that they put uh, to mortgage companies similar uh, to the analyses they would give a bank. Um, and then I guess the last one is this idea of leveling the playing field. Um, a mortgage uh, company, uh, as, as Chancellor said, you know, that's, I think, 72% of the California market. We really owe it to Californians, particularly lower income Californians, to make sure those companies, which are 72% of the market, are, are made available to them too. That the best products, the most competitively priced products are made available to all consumers and that they're not uh, just cherry picking in wealthier uh, communities. That's an equity issue. And I think that highlighting the equity nature of this is going to be really important as you move forward. So there you go. Thank you so much for sharing that and definitely for highlighting, you know, the importance of equity. I feel like that is a core value of a piece of legislation like this. Um, so now I'm going to turn the microphone to Tom um, and feel free to introduce yourself as you answer this question. But Tom, you were at Maha at the time, a lead co a lead sponsor of the 2000 bill. Um, can you begin by telling audience members your role in this campaign? Sure. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, I, as you said, uh, so let me just introduce our, um, me and my organization. Um, I'm representing uh, an organization called Partnership for Financial Equity. Um, we're kind of a unique organization in that half of our board are banks, um, mainly the CRA officers for, for banks and uh, half our community activists. Um, and we try to find common ground on issues like the racial wealth gap and, and other areas uh, uh, to try to gain more equity in the financial services industry. Um, and uh, as you just mentioned, um, prior to 18 months ago, I spent the last 30 years uh, as executive director of the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Alliance, uh, which works with uh, low and moderate income home buyers of color, um, trying to get them access to affordable mortgage programs um, and affordable home ownership opportunities uh, throughout the state. So we were very invested in this campaign from the beginning. Uh, Jim Campen, who Jarrett mentioned, uh, uh, was on our board uh, and was essentially our board volunteer research department <laughs> uh, cranking out these studies all the time. Um, so he brought uh, this issue to our attention as he did to Jarrett and others. Um, uh, when he, he did a study for the organization I work for now called Changing Patterns, um, it was an annual mortgage lending study. And one of the things it detected uh, in the early or the late mid to late 1990s is the toehold that subprime lenders um, the mortgage companies, um, but but particularly the subset of mortgage companies that were gaining a toehold in the refinance market were the subprime slash predatory uh, lenders of that era. 
Uh, and we saw that coming um, basically through, through initially uh, them gaining more and more market share in black and brown communities for refinancing and then eventually in the home purchase market. So we saw this, this sort of tidal wave of, of bad high cost loans being uh, marketed and uh, originated in, in low and moderate income neighborhoods and communities of color in Massachusetts. So, so that was really um, the motivation our board needed at Maha to really take this campaign on. Um, we were continuing to, the organization I work for now, Partnership for Financial Equities, continue to crank out the research every year. Every year, the research got worse in terms of the number of high cost loans that were going to um, low in income um, homeowners and home buyers. Um, and we, we just felt like it was a justice issue. It was an equity issue that we had to keep, keep going. Um, my first piece of advice really is find a legislator like Jared Barrios <laughs> to lead the charge because he wouldn't be denied. He was originally a, a state rep when he filed this bill for the first time, I think. And then he got promoted to the state Senate and uh, became our champion in in uh, in the Senate, but use those relationships he had built in the House to to really help us uh, navigate the legislative waters um, uh, and get this bill passed eventually in 2007. Um, so, just um, you know, it's a, it was an interesting time. Obviously, subprime lending was the dominant um, um, sort of conversation there. Um, so, this high cost subprime lending. Um, I think we took advantage of another sort of unique, um, it was also an era where, where our Mass Mortgage Bankers Association, the statewide trade association, was actually kicking out some of the subprime lenders of their association because of um, they were in the headlines getting sued and, and doing illegal um, lending activities. And so, um, so I think we capitalized on some turmoil within the industry that was fighting this um, too, that, that they, they were definitely still fighting it, but they were a little bit uh, in, um, in some turmoil, I think, in terms of that industry really trying to separate what they considered good actors from bad actors. And, um, and I think you know, we, we kind of swooped in with, with legislation that said, no, you all need to be regulated. Um, I think the other just thing I would say, Aaliyah, um, is, is uh, in building on what Jarrett said, I think the other argument we got from some of the, our opponents were um, CRA is deposit-based. Um, um, it, it, it relates to the FDIC insurance on deposits, and that's why there is a CRA for banks. I think actually today's environment where CRA reform is moving away from bricks and mortar um, links, um, right? Our, we anticipate CRA assessment areas for banks are going to be now not just exclusively where they have bricks and mortar branches, but where they're doing lending. And I think that's an argument for mortgage companies who don't have typically these bricks and mortar outlets, um, but, but have um, significant lending operations in a lot of different communities. Um, I think that's a, that plays into our argument that if you were designing CRA today, um, it would be malpractice not to um, uncover the, the mortgage companies which are, who are doing the lion's share of, of mortgage lending. Um, CRA is ultimately a, a law that was designed to um, address redlining and discrimination in mortgage lending, and you can't design it today without covering the major mortgage lenders. And those are independent mortgage companies. I'll leave you for now, at least with this statistic. Um, over the last, what has it been, 15 years or so, the first exam, by the way, we passed it in 2007. The first exam was in 2009. And we've had 173 exams of mortgage companies alone. Um, zero have received an outstanding rating. Six, high satisfactory. The vast majority, 148 satisfactory. 17 have received ne needs to improve and two, substantial non-compliance. Um, so 0% so um, outstanding. Just to give you some comparison, our state chartered credit unions 
8% approximately of those institutions get an outstanding rating and about 20%, well, 20, I think it's up to 22% of our banks get an outstanding rating. And I know we can't rely too much on the, the regulators' uh, ratings, but that gives you, I think, a sense of how it's needed, how mortgage, uh, how CRA is needed for credit unions in mortgage companies because they well underperform, um, at least in Massachusetts, underperform uh, the bank um, CRA rating uh, patterns. So I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Tom, for highlighting, you know, those numbers and just, you know, the the gaps that exist, especially if we don't, if we aren't able to measure how, you know, credit unions and mortgage companies are doing, we don't, we're not able to see where they're falling short. Um, and I also appreciate you bringing up the point about um, the fact that, you know, the landscape of financial services is changing. It's becoming more and more, you know, online based instead of brick and mortar based. And so with that, you know, we definitely need the legislation to be modernized to represent or reflect the modern times that we're in. Um, I just have one follow up question for you, Tom. Would you say that the, you know, efforts in Massachusetts um, well, my first question is, follow-up question is, how were you involved in the implementation of this law? And would you say those efforts have resulted in more investments into previously redlined communities? We were involved in the implementation. I, you know, the, the division, um, there was about a two-year period from the passage of the legislation to the first exam, which, you know, looking, we were, I think, at the time, probably a little frustrated that it took two years, but then looking back, it, it wasn't, um, given the, we were the first state in the country to cover mortgage companies, it was a brand new protocol for our division of banks. I think they actually did a reasonable job. Um, they also had they had public hearings um, um, on the regulations. Uh, we testified at those. We uh, were both formally a participant in those hearings and informally um, meeting on our own. Um, the legislative, co the grassroots coalition that, that helped pass the bill would meet regularly with the division of banks as they uh, sought to um, sort of put some regs behind the legislation. Um, so I think we we were very, at that time, we were very heavily involved in it. Um, you know, I think the weak, one of the weaknesses that I wish we had addressed um, or could address going forward and, and hopefully will be, will be able to address is, um, you know, I think the mortgage companies get way too much credit for doing FHA lending and not some of the more affordable um, options that exist here in Massachusetts. We have two state endorsed programs that are more affordable um, and are very competitive from a down payment um, and credit standpoint um, with FHA, but they're a lot more affordable in terms of their monthly payments and interest rates. Um, so uh, typically the mortgage companies don't participate in those programs. They lean back on FHA. And I think, um, you know, amending the law to um, allow the regulators to draw some more distinctions between serving low income buyers, buyers of color with higher cost products versus lower cost products um, should should be a point um, in their in their rating or or points deducted from their rating um, uh, when they're serving them with with higher cost products. So I think that's that's one area looking forward uh, that we'd like to address. Thank you, Tom. Um, so now I'm gonna turn the mic to Barika, um, who is based in New York. And something that I learned from our first conversation is that the New York State CRA was passed about a year after the federal CRA law. Um, and it largely mirrors the federal CRA law. However, over the last about 15 years, there's been some major updates to this law to make it more modern, um, including the most recent win in 2021, where you all got coverage for um, non-bank non mortgage lenders. Um, so, Barika, can you tell us, um, well, first introduce yourself and also tell us a little bit more about you know, what is the latest in New York and how and why you were uh, able to pass like a broad 
a broad bill and write those specific regulations in partnership with the Department of Financial Services. Sure, happy to. Um, thanks, Thalia, for, for having me and, and thanks to Rise Economy. Glad to be a part of this conversation and support our allies on the West Coast um, in doing this work. Um, so my name is Barika Williams. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD, um, and we're the Umbrella Community Development Organization in New York City. We've been in existence for 49 years um, and work with uh, more than 80 plus neighborhood based uh, nonprofit and citywide based nonprofit institutions um, throughout New York City, working on community development, um, equitable reinvestment, uh, affordable housing production, small businesses supports. So have been doing this work for, for quite a long time. And so I think to Aliyah's point, you know, we're in the New York is this unique example of um, having had this in place um, for quite a long time um, and being the example of both the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses um, of, of um, having a state CRA in place uh, and maybe some of the, some, some reflections for you all to think about in California of maybe what, what are the, um, what works. Um, so we, New York passed our state CRA, as Leah mentioned in 1978, it was a, a year after the federal CRA. Um, and really came out of, you know, uh, we were in the throes of uh, um, historic redlining there as opposed to modern day redlining now um, with poor um, and black and brown and LMI communities um, really um, being uh, abandoned by many banking and financial institutions in the 60s and 70s. And so that really activated um, a lot of the work around this and a lot of the advocacy work and an understanding and desire um, for government to stand up the a, a state CRA. So our New York CRA largely mirrors the federal CRA. Um, it's begun to go further in recent years, which Aliyah mentioned, um, but it really um, authorizes DFS, our department, to evaluate institutions um, similar to uh, um, what Tom mentioned in terms of putting them into the um, the four possible ratings. Uh, I would say, unlike Tom, um, uh, I think most of our folks end up in an outstanding or satisfactory. Um, unfortunately, um, we tend not to see um, uh, uh, as many um, institutions sort of end up with um, ratings of needs to improve or substantial non-compliance, which is some um, concerns. Uh, typically, the regula tech, typically regulators conduct the um, state CRAs exams concurrent to the federal regulator. So it is very strange that it's on this like um, very similar track, which we also then kind of limits what the state sometimes feels like it can do um, and impedes it feeling like it, it can um, behave in a way that is contradictory to maybe what is happening at the federal level, either in the examinations, in the questions, or in the determinations. Currently, our state CRA is probably regulating about 115 banks, um, and all of our, our banks are um, in New York State uh, chartered institutions. Um, uh, so this includes some of the biggest multifamily lenders. We'll, I'm sure, probably touch a little bit on this down the line, but formerly Signature, now New York Community Bank and Flagstar, Dime, Flushing, some of the big ones, but also um, including um, uh, some very large banks uh, um, uh, that have deposits across the country. Um, but keep in mind that they only were our evaluations are only on their activities within New York State. Um, uh, um, it's done studies, it's done, uh, DFS, our Department of Financial Services, um, has started to do studies and uh, through our advocacy, looking at um, non-bank and online small business lenders, um, uh, whether or not they would be well positioned to add them into the state CRA. We've had legislation introduced. Um, uh, and then obviously a, a place that Aliyah mentioned is non-bank multifamily lenders as well. Um, but it's just more limited. Our state CRA is more limited and focused than the federal um, CRA. Um, and so we've continued to push um, for recent updates. Uh, so we now include um, 
uh, responsible lending guidance around multifamily lending. This was a huge issue for ANHD and our members um, that um, reviewed safety and soundness uh, back in 2018. Also added an analysis of MWBEs to CRA examinations. Um, and this was a huge um, uh, uh, step forward because it was the first time that we explicitly addressed race in the CRA examinations. And that was 2019 to 2020. And then in 2021, expanded the CRA to cover non-bank mortgage lenders, um, so single family, one to four family, what we call our small home stock, um, uh, with the regulations uh, still sort of being developed and, and expanding. Um, but this is one of the key areas where um, our state CRA is extending beyond what is covered by the federal CRA. Um, uh, so it's it's a work in progress. I think one of the challenges of having something in place for such a long time means that it takes a substantial amount of work and advocacy to sort of shift and adjust the paradigm of um, uh, both how uh, DFS, the Department of Financial Services here in New York, thinks about the CRA and sort of you're always iterating off of a, the federal construct, because that's really what we're rooted in, whereas I know some other states and some of um, what California even is looking at would really start from a different place. We're sort of starting very tied um, to the CRA that we all sort of know and understand at the federal level, which, which can make it a little bit difficult and complicated. Thank you. And um, I just wanted to sort of hear more about um, your your thinking or the decision making and deciding to write more of a broad bill for some of these updates and then do more of the regulation writing and partnership with the Department of Financial Services versus having all of those details in the bill. What what was the strategy behind that? Um, so I think it's sort of a dual strategy. One is um, one is the strategy of what can what can move and get passed in Albany, um, which is our seat of state government and is quite a difficult place um, to sometimes uh, move through legislation and text. Um, and especially thinking about um, creating frameworks that seem to work um, across a very large, um, which I feel like is very similar to California, a very large state that has very different uh, banking and financial institution constructs um, in different parts of the state, right? We've got um, places that are banking deserts. We have places that um, where we're seeing um, incredibly um, exploitative practices happening. We have places where the concern is that they can't get a product um, uh, that applies to their population at all, right? So it's, it's sort of uh, a big piece recently has been um, uh, lending discrimination rates um, uh, um, and for uh, car loans and some other pieces. So we've got a, a like what is happening in different parts of the state can be very different. I feel like this is very similar to California and something that you all would also see and tackle. It feels like one of the things that we've been able to be more successful on. And this is, I would say, a Department of Financial Services that doesn't isn't willing to go as far as we would like to go at all, but it seems to be more effective right now to partner with DFS to push steps further than to try to go all the way to where we need to go with the state legislature and likely not um, get any movement forward for quite a long period of time, right? The, the um, we do a lot of advocacy and, and campaign and organizing work and movement building here in, um, in New York City and for New York State on a variety of different topics. The runway that it takes um, to sort of get to fruition with a bill, especially something that hasn't been socialized year after year after year, is quite long um, in New York. So uh, it feels a little bit... Um, difficult to sort of think about a uh, you know five ten year trajectory with zero movement in years zero through five or six um, as opposed to being able to sort of advance the container and then work within DFS and then advocate and push DFS 
internally to then advance what we need within after passing a bill that sort of gives us the container to work within. Thank you for sharing the thinking behind the advocacy strategy. Um, I'm now going to turn the mic to Brent uh, from the Woodstock Institute. Uh, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and share about you know what's happening in Illinois. Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, to introduce myself, I'll first say what Woodstock Institute is. This is our 50th anniversary. And we are a research and policy advocacy organization that focuses on consumer financial protection and community economic development. So within the community economic development realm is where the Community Reinvestment Act work falls. And to give a brief history, well, first of all, and who am I? I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy. I was the uh, head of the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation under a prior governor. So in that capacity, I did oversee the state's banking system, as well as its other financial institutions, credit unions, consumer lenders, so on and so forth. And then I hear now at Woodstock, I've been here for about seven and a half years overseeing our advocacy uh, within, generally speaking, that same space. So I've been working on these issues for quite a long time. And to give you some specific history about our uh, Community Reinvestment Act, um, it really was a perfect storm. And uh, there are a whole set of circumstances that would have to uh, occur again in precisely the same way for the Illinois experience to be replicated in any state, whether it be California or anywhere else. So I can't take all the credit at all, by any stretch of the imagination, there were a lot of external factors. And those external factors were the various things that were occurring in 2020, which many of us remember well. There was COVID, there were the civil, there was a civil unrest, there was the murder of George Floyd. And in Illinois, there was a seminal report about the disparities in mortgage lending in Chicago, which the basic conclusion was that there was more mortgage lending in a single white neighborhood in Chicago than in all black neighborhoods combined. And that really created a lot of anger among uh, legislators, which led to a black caucus agenda. So our state CRA was very specifically inspired by racial equity concerns. And within that black caucus agenda, there was a whole host of things related to a whole host of issues, healthcare, criminal justice reform, and economic access. And within the economic access pillar, there were four pillars, uh, was the state CRA. There was also our 36% uh, rate cap on consumer lending, which also passed as part of that overall package. So it, there was a lot of stuff that passed and it passed in the course of a week. So from introduction to passage, it was literally one week. Um, so again, it was this unique set of circumstances that sort of converged to create this moment uh, in history, frankly, which uh, I don't think I will likely see replicated in my lifetime. So I just want to stress that fact um, with respect to the history of our law. Now, a few things I want to mention where we are now. So moving then from passage, signing by the governor, uh, we have a great Department of Financial Professional Regulation. We work very closely with them. And again, that's the agency I used to lead. So I know the kind of the ins and outs there. Uh, they did come out with uh, advance notice of proposed, or proposed rules. We were disappointed. Those proposed rules, uh, similar, if you will, to the federal proposed rules, do shy away from the issue of race. And shy away is perhaps being generous. Uh, in a sense, one could say that they seemed the rules it looked at in isolation appear to be unaware that race exists. And at its core, and I this is me speaking on behalf of myself and on behalf of Woodstock, what what happens is legal gets involved. It's what legal, you know, there is this litigation fear that is behind this, this reluctance to embrace the need to specifically address race in the context of federal rules, state rules, any rules. And there are lots of smart people who have uh, opined about how you can address that. 
but still within agencies, there's just this fear of being sued. That doesn't even go beyond whether we might win. It's just the fear of being sued. So that's something that uh, I think we need to be cognizant of. How to address it is not something I can uh, I have the answer to, but it is a big factor in trying to get our government to do the right thing with respect to the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, a couple of things I want to mention that haven't been mentioned is uh, some arguments and ideas that were uh, percolated during the state CRA here. Um, one is uh, the opponent argument was, well, look at Massachusetts. There are still inequities there. It didn't solve all the Massachusetts problems. See, it doesn't work. That was an argument. Uh, and a response to that is like, well, imagine how much worse it might have been if there wasn't CSU CRA. So it's, um, but just be aware that that's something uh, that came up. Another thing that came up is that credit unions have field of membership restrictions. And how can you apply a CRA to that? Clearly, you know, the rules are mindful of those restrictions and don't require credit unions to violate their old field, own field of membership restrictions in order to comply. So that really was kind of a, Stupid argument, but one that they repeated um, ad nauseum. One proponent argument that I think is effective is that a state CRA, unlike the federal CRA, can pr promote state values in a very specific way. So the Illinois CRA has eight criteria in the law. And I want to highlight just a, three of those criteria because they are unique in their elevation within the context of the law. One is uh, or uh, is discrimination, uh, evidence of discriminatory and prohibited practices. So discrimination is in the top eight factors to be considered by examiners. Other things are include efforts working with customers to facilitate a resolution of a delinquency. That is, I think, a important criteria that is in the top pillar, uh, top tier of CRA consideration here in Illinois. And another thing which I'm particularly proud of or fond of is activities to ascertain the financial services needs of the community. In my experience dealing with the CRA, there's been a conspicuous lack of community in the CRA. I, I can count on one hand the number of times I've been contacted by a federal regulator to ascertain the needs of the community. So I think that's been a real uh, problem with the federal CRA that hopefully the state CRA will remedy. So we're in a wait and see mode, as is everyone else with respect to the federal CRA. Um, there's been a change in leadership within the division of banking, which I think will slow things down. So uh, we're in a wait and see mode to see what happens. We voiced our concerns about the absence of race from the rules, and we're just um, waiting to see what happens. I want to close by thanking Tom Callahan and use that as a piece of advice. Don't hesitate to contact us uh, who have had some experience with this. I'm putting my email in the, in the chat. Tom was an invaluable resource. I contacted Tom repeatedly. So those of us who've been through the CRA experience to whatever degree have some uh, value to bring to the conversation because in, our, in my experience, legislators want to know about what happened in other states, why it happened, and so on and so forth. So please don't hesitate to use me as a resource. But sorry, Tom, you are <laughs> the resource from our standpoint. So um, I'm both uh, putting a burden on Tom's shoulders and casting a light on his great contribution to this effort. Thank you, Aaliyah. And that's all. Thank you so much, Brent, for you know highlighting the very unique story of the Illinois CRA and some of the things that y'all were able to achieve there. Um, now we are going to turn to the audience for some question and answer. Um, I'm gonna start off with the first question here in the chat. And um, some of these questions, the uh, panelists have been able to answer. So you know, feel free to see if your question got answered. Um, this first question, um, I'm gonna uh, turn this question to Kevin who is here with Rise Economy. Um, credit unions were not covered under the federal CRA, right? If that is correct, they will be fighting hard against the state CRA. What are the reasons Rise believes should be used to argue for credit union inclusion? Um, well, thank you, Aaliyah. And uh, just 
quickly, thanks so much to the panelists. It's so great to see you all. You, you're all such great friends and allies of ours. <laughs> and what a, what a super discussion. Um, I'm just hoping I'm not going to ruin it. Uh, on credit unions, we, I mean, I think, um, I think Tom framed it really well. If we were designing CRA today, which in a sense, you know, that's what we're proposing to do right now. What should CRA be for California? We would include credit unions. We're concerned about financial institutions not serving all communities, um, communities of color and low-income communities in particular. And I know over the many years I've been at uh, Rise Economy, uh, even before it was called Rise Economy for a long time, and when we looked at lending by credit unions, we saw disparities. I remember reports from NCRC from many years ago that said when you looked at credit union lending versus bank lending, the credit unions seemed to be worse. There were greater disparities. Yes, there are certain kind of nuances, and those should be accounted for. But the bottom line is we want all financial institutions to serve all communities fairly, and that would certainly include credit unions. Um, and yes, we, we, unfortunately, you know, I'll say this, you know, the credit unions hold themselves out as really serving their members and communities. And we find that they almost always oppose legislation that, that we are sponsoring or we're supportive of. They always seem to be on the wrong side of us. So we would fully expect that, unfortunately, to be the case this time around. Maybe, you know, maybe they'll surprise us and we can find some common ground. We would hope so, because it does seem like we all should be able to come together and say, you know, lending and financial services should be equally accessible to all. There shouldn't be discrimination. There shouldn't be unfairness. And uh, hopefully we can figure it out. But if not, you know, we we hope to fight for what we think is needed. Thank you for that and for just, you know, highlighting some of the goals of a California specific CRA. Um, we have another question that I see and it says, is the participation of grassroots support by the targeted population important in getting a state CRA passed? Um, I see Brent typing an answer, but I don't know if anyone <laughs> wants to come on. Yeah, it was that you're, you're <laughs> right. So the advocate in me says yes. But the historian in me says no, as it relates to the Illinois CRA, for the reasons I described, it was passed, it was introduced and passed in a week. Uh, it was really kind of greased to go legislatively, and rarely does that happen in our favor, but it was a unique time in history. So uh, the advocate in me says, yes, we need to organize, 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 but Illinois was a kind of a, a blessed quirk in history in that it it was greased to go from from the start. So that's the answer. Uh, oh, if I can jump in here, because I, I uh, very much agree with what Brent said, which is like every now and then we get these unique moments and opportunities to like jump and leap forward when various different stars and timings and sequencing align. And so I think Illinois very much had that and got a chance to sort of like just take this huge jump with with the with the um black policy agenda. That is so rare and few and far between um for like most of what I feel like most of us are seeing in in sort of any of this work. Um, and so I think it's it's just utterly it's so critical to do the organizing work and to involve um, grassroots leaders and organizations and those impacted because it you know this is something that I think a lot of us probably had the the few legislators like Jarrett when he was there who get it and who are like okay yes you know but most of who we're talking to don't necessarily really understand the issue can't really dig in, are not necessarily able to draw the connections between these sort of like big systems pieces and aspects that we're talking about with what this means and how it impacts their constituency in their district, like why, why and how this is going to change lives. And so I think what really matters and what we've seen be incredibly impactful is like, um, uh, um, to, 
to, I think it was Tom was talking about the report and maybe Brent too, is to have Miss Jones there. She sits down in the office. She's mm-hmm. like, I am, you know, I am covered by a non-traditional, I, my, I receive my mortgage from a non-traditional institution. They're not covered by the state CRA. This is what this means. It is happening to me. Does that take a lot of work to get your leaders to a place where they can articulate that to their elected officials? Absolutely. Um, but that's what changes the needle. It, it like our report is this, uh, the reports and the analysis are the precursor and the supplements, but it does not replace um, having the, that grassroots work really move elected officials. Can I um, add a little bit? Thank you, Barika. I Like a thousand, can I do like five plus ones? Like or that's cheating probably, but I, I absolutely agree. And I want to add, um, Leah, I think that you guys need to think about, or we need to think about, because I live in California now, um, we need to think about kind of narrative building on this. And by that, I mean, so Barika, building on your point, right? The, these grassroots organizations are going to be able to identify members, consumers who have experiences with either being able to access credit, crappy credit, right? Like a, a bad mortgage product or no credit at all. And the story that we want to tell, we want to connect why institutions and their practices, what that means for Mrs. Jones. I think that's who you said, Barika, right? Mrs. Jones. Uh, um, so we'll stick with Mrs. Jones. And the fact that she was only offered a sort of a subprime mortgage product, right? Well, if we had everybody following the rules so that everybody in this, you know, kind of people, everybody had access to the same products that wealthy suburban communities were being offered at competitive interest rates and so forth, then you then it looks different and people understand how the dots are connected, right? So that it's not like this very abstract, um, you know, reporting, it can be very dry, right? When you talk about CRA reports, if you ever read any of those reports, they're not, they're not sexy documents, but, but what they mean when you take it home is access to better credit, which means fewer foreclosures, lower mortgage payments, the kind of stuff that poor and working people need and deserve. Um, and so I think linking it to that in your narrative is going to be very important. And Ali, if I if I could just to, I mean, maybe you're going to do this in a few minutes, but w- w- Rise Economy at our best, we are we are listening to our members. We are working with our nonprofit organizational members, most of whom have clients, are grassroots, are in the communities. And we really need you for this campaign. It's going to be a big fight. If you are at all interested, you should connect with us. Maybe Aliyah is a good point of contact, um, anyone you know here. But we need to, if we're going to do this, we need to do it together and we need to work with our members. Um, so it's a great question. It's a great point, And we look forward to kind of making this happen with you. Yes, thank you so much, Kevin, for driving that point home. Um, and so that does wrap up our Q&A section. I know there were a few questions that we didn't get a chance to get to, but we will definitely um, try and answer those questions and get those answers to the people who asked them. So I, I really appreciate everyone's, you know, thinking the audience for you all getting us, you know, thinking about um, this issue on a deeper level. And so kind of connected to what Kevin said, you know, we are here to organize to win. And in order to do that, we're going to need you all's support. Um, And so there is a typo, but keep up with keep up with Rise Economy um, on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all under Rise Economy. Um, Stories go a really long way and really painting the picture of why this is such an important need. Um, In the words of Jared, you know, the CRA is not that sexy. And so, you know, for some people, it can really be hard or take a lot of time to understand the need. And so that is the value of stories is that it really paints a clear picture on on who, you know, this issue will impact and, you know, how this issue or how this solution can really make a difference. And the last thing is that when the time comes, sign on, you know, we are going to be reaching out, us, the organizing team will be reaching out to you all's respective organizations to sign on for support, to maybe call in um, for a Me Too to our legislator, or even to write a letter of support from the perspective of your organization. And so when that time comes, that's when we're really going to need y'all to show up. Um, 
And so with that said, thank you all so much for your participation. Thank you to our lovely panelists for taking out the time and your busy schedules to really shed the light on such an important issue. Um, if you all have any questions, maybe you weren't able to get your question in the chat box or just thoughts come up um, throughout the day, the next weeks, months, or even over the next year as we're pushing for this legislation, feel free to reach out to me via email or anyone in on the Rise Economy team. Thank you everyone so much. And I will see you all soon.